it's always so nice to have you uh, at Engineering Students Council event uh, for you to share your wisdom and your vast experience with us. Uh, it's truly amazing. So today we wanted to focus more on uh, the topic, who speaks for Hinduism. This is a topic that we uh, touched upon uh, in our student panel on cultural appropriation. Um, on this panel, I wanted to explore with you some topics uh, regarding uh, Hinduism's uh, sort of portrayals and narratives about Hinduism within academia, within media, and within the entertainment <coughs> industry. Um, and so since we are on a college campus at MIT, I wanted to start with narratives about Hinduism in, a in academia. So, uh, like Raghav was saying, you are founder and director of Infinity Foundation, uh, which used to give out a lot of grants to different universities to start Indian Studies programs, Indian Studies programs, professorships, but that's something that Infinity Foundation has decided not to do anymore. So what were the problems that you saw within academia that sort of led you to believe, right, that um, these misportrayals that we see, you can touch upon what they are, um, sort of why that couldn't be fixed from within the academia itself? Well, first of all, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for inviting me. HSC is an amazing platform. Some excellent leaders, lots of friends I made this way. Um, the topic of this panel is who speaks for Hinduism. We should add, and who speaks against it. Because it's really, uh, that's the topic. Who speaks for Hinduism and who speaks against it. Both uh, are going on very actively. So that takes me to the question you asked about academia, where people who are supposed to be speaking for it are actually speaking against it also. Mm -hmm. To give you some historical background, uh, until uh, early mid-90s, I was in a very successful business career, had a lot of companies, and then I had some transformations and decided to leave all that and get into this full time. So for, since then I've been in it for full time, it's not some side hobby or anything. And therefore, the uh, putting away my funds, my own money, quite a large sum, to fund Indian studies, Hinduism studies and so on, was a huge sacrifice. Not only a very large amount of money by any standards, but a huge, very large percentage of all I had made. And then the decision not to be making any money anymore, which means that for all these years I haven't had a paycheck. You can really think about it. I'm just living off of old savings. So it's, a, it's, it's not something I take lightly. And obviously if I make that kind of a sacrifice and not with other people's money, raising funds from other people but my own, I, it behooves me to pay attention to what's going on, is it good, is it not good. So I did that. And therefore my experience with the academy is kind of unique. Mm -hmm. because. Till then, nobody had done this. In fact, the academic people would say that nobody else, you're the first person who's come forth. Uh, I have so many letters from Harvard, from Columbia, from all sorts of places, basically saying we wish there were more people like you. This is the early, the first experience. Right. When I was giving money, and they were so happy, and they would sort of praise me and, you know, uh, give me all these accolades and all that. Serious, large sums of money. Uh, and I, uh, being a, corporate person, I, you know, you, you fund projects, you fund them in stages, uh, and then you set, have benchmarks, you evaluate, you don't just sort of write a, write a check and forget about it, right. because it's not somebody else's money, it's very hard on money. And being a management consultant who had done this, as in a formal way, as for many uh, clients, I decided that I should apply the same standard of discipline on this. So I would give I would set up a strategic relationship, a big vision, and then we would start implementing it in stages with milestones, benchmarks, so I could know, I could figure out what's going on. And the results led to my decisions. So I gave, I engaged 25 different universities, three or 400 different grants. I would say uh, when I was uh, coming down here this morning, I was thinking of just from memory, uh, in this area, in the Boston area, Harvard was one of the large recipients. Columbia in New York area. University of California was a very big one. And uh, University of Hawaii. And they were all very different programs. Uh, in um, Harvard, it was Indology. Uh, in um, Columbia, it was Advait, non-dualism, bringing in Buddhism, Hinduism, quantum physics, uh, neuroscience to, to investigate that. 
In uh, University of Hawaii, we built the second most uh, highly rated uh, center for Indian philosophy in the world at that time. We built it over eight years of giving them grants. And University of California, we built the first program on science and religion with the Dharma as the instead of religion, because the science and religion programs were all about Judeo Christianity and science. So we built one way with Dharma and science. Mm -hmm. So we did compiling work. Yeah. And we got to know everybody who was anybody in Hinduism studies. All the people are who are now upset at me and I critique them, at one point in time we used to fund them. We funded Vendi Dhanigar as a distinguished lecturer. Wow. Uh, uh, you know, all of that. So I, most of these people, I know I have uh, a huge amount of stuff archive on them. Maybe someday somebody can volunteer, we can data mine them, and there are some interesting things that happen. Okay. I found that uh, consistently they were very nice verbally, lots of accolades, lots of photo ops, but I'm a hard nosed businessman who wants results. And I'm putting my money not for that because I could do many more things if that's, that were my goal. I wanted some real genuine change. I found that most of the researchers had, who are senior are so hard entrenched in their ideology by the time they are at a senior position, they are not going to write off 20, 30 years of all the work they've done and start all over. They're not going to say what I did previously is not correct, I'm, I stand corrected. They're not going to do that no matter how much you pay them. The younger ones are still wanting to build their career and they, are, they don't want to break ranks. They don't want to kind of, you know, become, become a sort of a, a person who is blacklisted. They don't want to be blacklisted. And nor, nor do they, because you know, blacklisting is not some official system. I know, I've known at least 10 people who got blacklisted. A few of them, maybe I caused it. I hope uh, I, you know, uh, they don't mind it. They did they, they, their stuff voluntarily. They got into the program and they were very active and energetic. Some of them pushed back. One of them uh, quit because he said he's been told by this person, don't go and get involved in all these things. It would be bad for your career. So he resigned. But some people continued and it wasn't very good for their career. I would say there's another 10 or 20 who had, had nothing to do with. They came to me because their careers had been destroyed. <laughs> Uh, since they had uh, stuck their neck out, right. including Western people, yeah. not just Indian people. So I, I started looking at why is this so, and, and the problem is much deeper than people understand. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the individual who even wants to do this cannot do it alone, because in any university you have a whole ecosystem. Religious, religion department goes with another department in philosophy, another department in psychology and mind sciences, another department in anthropology, social sciences, political science, all these different disciplines, they all feed off of each other. The way the Western humanities is segmented, the boundaries of each discipline have leaders who are considered to be the authorities. And they keep generating a parampara of students who keep replicating the same ideas. Now, if a person wants to quote uh, Hindu religion and he's in the history department, he will just take the line from a well-known person. And a person in the anthropology department who wants to write about, you know, who were these Aryans or what happened in Harappa, he just quote a standard guy from the history department. So the authority figures feed off of each other and that coalition of authorities is very hard to break. So it's almost like you cannot, it's not enough to just break the whole Hinduism department or religion department. You have to take over, take on the whole humanities, yeah. and it's not just in one university. All the universities are an ecosystem. Just to give an example, if you go to any of the humanities national conferences, the American Academy of Religion, a similar conference for anthropology, a few major conferences for social sciences, some conferences for history. You take any of these, you will find that their membership of academics is like ten to twenty thousand. That's how many people, how big these fields are. So you're talking about, you know, in all these humanities put together over 100,000 people. How do you put one chair here and expect this guy to make any difference at all? So I'll tell you what happened uh, to give you a few examples. Uh, once at Harvard, we put up a visiting professorship and we convinced them to bring Arvind Sharma. Yes. So uh, some of these tricks you learn. So Diana Eck was on vacation uh, during the summer. And Michael Witt had actually helped me. 
Wow. Yeah, and Michael, he said, Dynamic is on vacation. We can do this. So I said, okay, fine. I want to, I want to, first of all, my choice of professor, which is, in, according to their rules, you give the money, they put up a search committee, and they have equal opportunity hiring and all that. But behind the scenes, you can tell them that's the guy to hire. So he said, okay, we'll do that. Then I said, I wanted to teach two courses. One of the courses was misrepresentation, misrepresentations of Hinduism in the American Academy. He accepted it. The second course was, this is back in the 90s, I've been working on these teams since then, and I have that catalog of that year. I think uh, Kanchan probably knows because he sent some students to, uh, to that course. Uh, the other topic was uh, uh, unacknowledged appropriations of, of Hinduism uh, in, 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 the, in the American Academy, something like that, something like that. These courses were officially approved. They were in the course catalog. So once it's printed, you cannot unprint it. Students signed up. I think it, uh, HSC got some students in. And then Diana Ek arrives oh. from vacation. So now I get a phone call from Arvind Sharma saying, there is problem. I said, well, what is the problem? He said, oh, that she is living. She is angry. She is shouting. She is saying, this is an insult to her because she thinks she's in charge of the Hinduism studies. And if we say misrepresentation in Hinduism, then it sort of like it means that she hasn't been doing her job or it's like a slap on the face for her. Right. Although we were not talking about any person, but she took it personally. Mm -hmm. So there was a quite a commotion, but you know, a deal is a deal, so they kept this going. Then we got uh, uh, Ashoka Kruzkar as visiting professor. So I've had that experience. Right. I've also had experience successfully. So in Rutgers, they wanted to start Hindi. So they said we need, uh, we, we have uh, one uh, section and uh, a, a section can have only so many, but if we had more funding, we'd have more teachers. And there are so many Indian students here, it would be very good. So I said, uh, I, had, I had heard, I had uh, understood how Hindi is actually Urdu, they're teaching. Mm -hmm. And in Harvard and MIT, a man called Ali Asani, I don't know if he's still there, Pakistani, uh, he used to be teaching Hindi 101, 102, 103, whatever the levels are, and Urdu. But when you sign up for Hindi, or somebody signs up for Urdu, you're sitting in the same class. Uh, you get uh, Hindi 101 on your course, and this fellow, this fellow will get Urdu, but you're sitting in the same class doing the same thing. And he will, in the first couple of lectures, dismiss Hindi as too complicated, you don't need it, and Urdu has got more poetry, and it's more sophisticated, and look at the... And so he steered these students into that, teach mostly Urdu. And the Hindi poets and writers prescribed for reading are rebellious against, you know, somebody for women's rights. So they're all against Hinduism. Okay, so Hinduism, Hindi is being taught through rebellion. Urdu is being taught through beauty, poetry, you know, all these great Urdu poets and all that. And by the time you're in your second year, third year, you're going to his house, he's hosting these students, and he's really making you comfortable. Actually, I found this out because a few kids of my friends had gone through this. Yeah. And I could see that they are changed. They, I mean, they were difficult. They had nothing to do with their culture. They are disordered because of this. So I decided that if Rutgers wants Hindi, it should not be Urdu. So I, I, they told me you can't influence it. It will be considered a kind of prejudice, racial prejudice, whatever you should say, that only a Hindi, Hindu guy can teach. Yeah. Luckily, the uh, man who was in charge of the language, languages, dean of languages, was a Korean. So I met this gentleman. Yeah. And I said, what if somebody wanted to sponsor Korean language, and somebody said it's the same as Japanese, and it's the same as Chinese, so you sit and learn Chinese and Korean together. He said, we'd never accept it. Right. So I said, okay, so you see the difference between Korean and Chinese, even though they have common vocabulary, common history, but Korean is Korean, and that's what you want. So he said, of course, that's what he was very uh, sure about. It. So I said, help me solve this problem, and then I'll fund Hindi. So he told me how to solve the problem without getting into legal difficulty. And what he said is that you are allowed to put in the job description certain things that are not considered prejudiced. So you can say, must have native fluency of speaking. So he should be able to speak like a native. Right. He said, all these other fellows, 
they will talk with this accent and all that stuff. So they'll be out. And then you should you should be able to list texts which the person in the classics. So you can put uh, some a particular uh, Tulsi Ramayana, or you can put some you can put some uh, text, important text, some Hindi versions of uh, Ramayana, Hindi versions, Hindi editions of Mahabharat, Hindi editions of uh, you know uh, Prem Chand, yeah. and those kind of things you can list and say that the guy should have knowledge of this. So this is how we got Hindi introduced in uh, Rutgers and then we phased out and other people took over. So like this I could tell you lots of stories of fighting uphill battles in every university. But I could do that because I was engaged. I'm an entrepreneur. I know how to negotiate. I'm not scared of these people because I've run big companies. I'm not scared of Westerners because it worked for me. Uh, you know, most of my career, they were working for me. Most of my business career in IT. So I'm quite comfortable uh, in, uh, in taking on any such situation. Now, I realize that after all of this, the change is very slow and it's really not working out. I mean, I, 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 the real problem is we need our own ecosystem. Yes. Uh, in, their, in somebody else's ecosystem, you plant a few things isolated here and there, uh, you know, you're just wasting time. In fact, you're empowering the other side. So we need to create our own ecosystem. So I went through the stage of becoming my own author, becoming my own scholar. Not because I'm the greatest, but because I had to do it. I mean, I'd rather be just retired guy and uh, have spent the last 20 years like normal retired people. Yeah. But nobody else is doing it, so I had to do this. And uh, I have learned a lot on well, what the topics are, what the issues are, where we have to take on, change the battlefield, and who are the opponents, the, who, how, what are their positions, why they're taking those stands, what's their assumptions, where are their flaws and weaknesses. So I figured that out. I've got a map. So I decided that now what I'm going to do is not fund someone to do whatever they feel like doing. Right. But I want to develop my... So I write a book, The Battle for Sanskrit, and based on the topics and the themes in it, we fund young scholars to take that research further. So we are nurturing scholars to continue this research beyond what I could do. Right. And we've done two conferences, and we have about 50 very solid papers uh, in these two conferences by mostly young people. They will be put out in four volumes, four volumes. So uh, we are nurturing the next generation of our own scholars. Yeah. So this is our ecosystem. Yeah. And there are, they are people who are very no-nonsense Hindus. They are very loyal to the tradition. And they don't have to pretend that they are some, some kind of uh, in a neutral space or something like that. You know, if you look at the study of Hindu, the study of religion, you will find that almost every uh, Jewish professor, every professor of Judaism is a rabbi. Yeah. Rabbi. Yeah. You will find that most professors of Islam are Westerners, with, or either they are practicing Muslims, or if they are Westerners, they are very liberal, left-wing, uh, anti-Israel, pro-Palestine, somehow the, the left-wing has got an affinity with Islam, they are on their side. If you look at professors of Buddhism, most of them are uh, people initiated by the Dalai Lama and they are practicing Buddhists. If you look at Christians, they are both kinds. There is the people produced from seminaries who are like 65-70% of the religious studies. Uh, and then there is 30% who are not religious studies, uh, seminary products. But they are deep down the Western secular space, even though it may be critical of, uh, of uh, Christianity, but very, but very few of them basically undermine the premises of Christianity in the, in the academy. So even if there is an attack, people tell me, well, there are attacks on other religions too. Yes, but they have a home team to defend. If you make an attack on Islam, there will be a lot of responses. If you make an attack on Judaism, they will call you anti-Semitic right away. If you have an attack on Christianity, and there are many attacks on Christianity, you will find the solid response from uh, you know, the theological uh, schools various uh, uh, schools like that. There's about, I would say, uh, several dozen theological seminaries in this country uh, with a total population of about 50,000, 60,000 students who are studying theology, Christian theology. That's a large yeah. army of home teams are producing. So we don't have that ecosystem. So I, I decided that really what, what I call it feeding the crocodiles, meaning you're, you're feeding your opponents. You're feeding this crocodile thinking if I give him enough food, he'll become like a pet dog. But a crocodile will not become a dog if you feed it, he doesn't eat your arm. So feeding our opponents is like feeding the crocodiles. We're making them stronger. We're giving them the sustenance, the money, the reputation, the prestige, 
that they used in, in fact against us. So I have, I do not fund any of these guys. Now there are some recent movements to start funding all these. They are doing what I stopped doing 20 years ago. Because it's fashionable, you can become popular, you can get your kids into Harvard, you can get to be on a committee in some board of advisors in one of these universities, and you're sitting in the high chair, maybe it will be good for your business deals, because it's all about networking, you meet other high class people from very high, you know, high net worths, and so you're in the billionaire club. So by giving a few million, you can enter the billionaire club, and you and your kids will enjoy that status. It's a lot about that. Uh, mo hardly anybody I met, who is a donor, has really done the hard work I did. Mm -hmm. um, they haven't even read the research writings of the people they are funding. They do not know how to refute them. They are even scared to refute them. So my recent, most recent uh, encounter with Sheldon Pollock, most of the people who are funding him, they have they found nothing wrong. And now we produce 50 papers by 50 by different right. people, which are going into great details on what all the problems are. So I think you've explained really well and very very uh, interesting. I, I, I could write about book on my uh, 25 years of funding the economy. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, but I wanted to ask you more specifically, so you mentioned that in a lot of these other um, religions, how they're taught in the academy, they're taught by practitioners. So why is Hinduism different? How did this sort of start? And what have been the implications of this going forward, right? Because some people say, what difference does it make if, you know, someone in some cozy academician club is teaching Hinduism this way, it's not going to percolate down. So what are some examples of the way... Well, it does percolate down. The CNN uh, Agori episode, I did this with you. Yeah. In fact, uh, they, they consulted some professor type people. I mean, that knowledge didn't come out of the sky. Uh, this guy is not an expert. So what starts in the academic world filters down to education because these are the people who write college uh, school textbooks. All the school textbook, if you look at it, these such people write it. Then they train the journalists. So Columbia School of Journalism, uh, in journalism students from various prestigious places, they, when, they, when they are a student of journalism, they are also taking a course in South Asian studies. You know, they are taking a course in something. So they are being influenced. So the, the, the Hinduism has taught in the academy, has its influence on other humanities, it has its influence on journalism, movie makers, filmmakers in the future, policy makers, people in think tanks, American think tanks, Indian think tanks, who are writing policy, they are quoting these kind of people as experts. So, if you look at uh, if you look at a network of how knowledge which starts here, it percolates into the public. It goes through various. I have a flowchart actually. I have a uh, I have a slide that I've presented many times. It goes through knowledge, goes through public policy, it goes through education, it goes through seminaries, it go, it goes through you know various uh, domains, various disciplines that it goes through. So. It is not something that's isolated to the academic world. And the academic uh, stamp of authority and approval on a particular thesis or a particular position is very robust in this country. Very difficult to break. So we are taking on a very tough problem. So how is the ecosystem that you're building through this Swadeshi Indology Conference to Infinity Foundation India, which was launched recently, how will that help um, sort of combat these misrepresentations that we see in the academy here? And I also wanted to get your opinion on uh, what you feel the role of the uh, ethic perspective, right, so the non-emic perspective within ac uh, academic studies of Hinduism is. Yeah. So the uh, the ecosystem nowadays it's a global thing. Yeah. So the ecosystem in India and elsewhere is all into one, because you find that the problems which started here got exported to India, and all the whole Indian left and the Hindu phobics are basically teaching the same stuff. Uh, Wendy Donegal students are all over. In India, uh, you know, all those people, I would say the top 50 uh, culprits in Hindu phobia in the Western Academy that I've been talking about, each of them got lots of uh, lineage in India. People come here, they take these courses, they're very proud, then the professor writes re recommendation letters, he gets them assigned there, and so this thing continues. The, to, the fight also is global. So the ecosystem we have to create is on a worldwide basis. These Swadeshi Indology conferences, we had people from various countries. We had European people from Europe, people from US, people from India. We are holding them in India because they send the message. Mm -hmm. And also, it's more cost effective. Uh, uh, also, uh, we want to kind of invigorate in Hinduism in its soil and give it that legitimacy, you know, that this we can do. Uh, we also want to open the government and some prestigious institutions. So we are doing that. 
that's kind of our, that made the opposition scared because they, they, they can close the gates here to let, uh, to prevent certain kind of ideologies, ideologies coming in. Well, we found a new place. We don't need them. Now they are concerned about us becoming too powerful, mm -hmm. which is a good place to be for us. So we are creating people who will then get jobs as scholars. And we are giving them stipends. There will be, there'll be a few books. So besides the four volumes on the papers produced, there are in addition going to be three more volumes which are single author monographs of the best, uh, the people who did the best work, we're sponsoring them to actually, if you want to turn them into scholars, publish well, help them market, help them go around giving talks and lectures. So I'm personally committed to building careers for young people. Right. Yeah. So imagine if the money I gave, which is like in the millions, I mean, imagine uh, if I had that now, I mean, I could do a lot of work. So I would wish that the people who have the funds now would listen to my advice, uh, would, would have me advise them on how to use that money to really make a big impact, you see. The, one of the problems we have is short-term thinking rather than long-term thinking. The solution I am I'm working on will not produce results like you, you're not going to get anything in six months. Right. Whereas if you are now a chair, you get your name on a building somewhere, and your kid gets into Harvard, you get into some uh, advisory committee, and you hobnob with some billionaires, and you get some deals, and you, uh, you can show off back home that you, know, you become a big shot. Results are, the gratification is quick. It, and, uh, but, and so they're not looking at what the long-term implications are. That's one of the issues we're facing, is a very short-sighted, myopic view, also selfish view. Sure. So I guess um, to sort of just hone in a little bit, I wanted to get your take on some specific examples, right, of things that academics have said in their writings and their books that have now become sort of the mainstream perception of Hinduism in this country and also exporting it back to India. Well, if you look at history, the whole history of India uh, is said to have the, the Western view, which has become standard worldwide, even in, uh, even in Indian government. I did a recent episode on how the civil services are colonized. The civil service exams are asking questions and expecting answers that are wrong. Uh, you know, and, and so that's how bad it is. Mm -hmm. So it's everything to do with this Aryan Dravidian divide. It's everything to do with the origins of Hinduism as some kind of hodgepodge, not really a religion, just put together with some random assortments from here and there. Uh, all of that to the role of women the divisiveness of caste and all that, irrationality, illogical, not progressive, backward people. It's sort of, you know, it's a replay of the of the rhetoric which was used against free Christian people when they were Christianized. So the first continent to be Christianized was Europe. And then of course Africa and America, and now Asia. So when the Europeans were being uh, Christianized, free Christian pagan culture, was ill-treated, beaten up, you know, they were persecuted. They, first, they suffered a cultural genocide. So I, I tell my white friends that actually if you look before uh, a few centuries, your heritage was not Christian, it was not Judeo Christian. You were closer to the Hindu culture because they were pagans, you know. Now there's big differences between Hinduism and paganism, so I'm not equating them. But I'm saying that they were the pre-Christian pre people faced similar issues. So we are facing uh, some of that, you know, uh, some of this, uh, some of the uh, treatment uh, of the Westerner, uh, you know, colonizing and, con and invading Africa, Americas. All that got superimposed upon us. So we never responded. Our people just never responded to that. And, and this has uh, percolated down to society so that many people in the mainstream who are well-meaning, who think of themselves as Hindus, this is their view of themselves. And I, I would say that the worst colonizers of Hindu, of our people, are Indians now. The worst colonizers are Indians. So it's like a cancer starts in one organ, and then it metastasizes and goes elsewhere. And then all these organs become bases from where it's operating. So this cancer has spread, and in India you have the institution of media, the institution of government, education. So many kinds of uh, Indian institutions are colonized, even gurus. I'm doing a TV series on colonized gurus. I mean, I'm in enough trouble already, but I might even get more trouble, who cares? So I've done on the government, civil services, I've done on the left, and done on the media. I'm also 
developing data to talk, take on some, some problems I see with some, many of the gurus. I mean, nothing personal about them because I respect them profound. But I think their views, when they are talking about Vedanta and Advaita and uh, Ramayana and all that, they are on solid ground. Mm -hmm. But when they are trying to compare with Christianity, they really don't know much. They really don't know enough to be able to say that oh, everything is same and so on and to put uh, Jesus is same as Krishna and all that kind of stuff that you see. So I'm, I'm actually going to take that on. I, and I really feel that uh, Indians, Indian Hindus have become some of the worst colonizers. So you mentioned uh, the CNN episode on the uh, Kordis, uh, the Believer series uh, produced by Reza Aslan with CNN. So how would you respond to someone right, who doesn't necessarily see something wrong with that type of representation of Hinduism, saying that like, oh, all of these things happen, they're part of Hinduism. So what is wrong with showing it? Well, firstly, that particular community is not what he said it is. That's the first problem. It's a, it's a distortion of a particular community. There are some good Western uh, scholars who've written on, the, on these kind of communities and quite okay with it. But this fellow did not consult them. He didn't do his homework properly. So that's one issue. Second issue is then, then the impression given that this is sort of a view of Hinduism uh, is the second problem. And, and, and then he's not open to criticism. He's not open to bringing in people like us on his show or, or even after the show doing a sequel to it. I mean, I've invited him to come on my TV show. He hasn't even bothered responding. You know, after our uh, thing, we got like uh, 160,000 or more views on, on our show, uh, maybe closer to 200,000 now on uh, YouTube and Facebook, which is quite a lot. And he has, involved, he has no interest in dealing with us. So there's an arrogance of authority. And, and you know, when you have complicated things like somebody else's culture, and he's a Muslim, Iranian Muslim, this guy. Uh, you know, you're talking about somebody else's culture, you're taking these liberties, and people of that culture are saying this is wrong. And you're so arrogant, you don't even care. There's something wrong with that. I mean, he would, he would, he has not picked a Muslim issue. He's going after cults. So he's profiled a Hindu community as a cult and then he's going after some cult here and there. Every episode is some extreme, weird kind of people, mm -hmm. but not a Muslim group. So I think what you said right now is uh, sort of encapsulating a very central topic to this discussion, which is who speaks for Hinduism, who sort of sets the term for it. So why, in your view, is it the case that uh, sort of Hindus are always relegated to not speaking for their own tradition and it's others who end up speaking for Hinduism? Well, the uh, Hindus have a confusion Mm. Gurus have a confusion uh, between uh, preaching and academic teaching. Because we have enough Hindu preachers, enough Hindu gurus, they feel that there's no problem because they don't understand that the academic space is different. It's a, it requires a different tone and it's for a different audience and a different purpose. So because we have so many ashrams and temples, they're saying, what's the problem? So they don't understand that that space is separate. That's the space where insiders come and who are already into bhakti or into meditation or something and they get taught and there is no body challenging. I have heard people say, what's the problem? I run my temple, nobody bothers me. I teach whatever I feel like. Why are you saying that we can't teach? I'm, I can teach whatever I want. He doesn't get it. That, that that space is different than the academic space. And since he doesn't know enough about the academic space and the power and the influence it has over society, he doesn't, he trivializes it. He thinks that there is no problem or it's a very minor problem and he shouldn't worry about it. He's more concerned about his teachings within his, his, his uh, community, his right. model. The Christians have a history of expansion, so they know that your message should also reach outsiders. It's not only for those who come to the church. Mm -hmm. it yeah. is, and the Islam is not only for those who go for Friday prayer to the mosque. The message should reach the world because we're out there to take over everybody. So they've had centuries of experience on marketing. How do you market to non-believers, our people outside, outside your faith? So they've cultivated, whether it's through uh, soldiers fighting, whether it's through funding, whether it's through missionary work, subterfuge, whatever the techniques are, these are, uh, these are this is guerrilla warfare, the kind of uh, intellectual and emotional guerrilla warfare that they've been engaged in for a very long time. So they have experience. We have not had the experience in Hinduism, of going out and taking on and uh, spreading our knowledge to uh, the, the whole world in a very aggressive way. 
And our people are fairly content that we're okay, we're doing fine amongst ourselves. And the uh, Hindu, now Hindus, so I would say that the uh, major institutions of Hinduism have had the responsibility to do this. Small guys can't do this. They, they should have, by now, some big, huge Hindu group should have set up, you know, 10 seminaries. They should have set up 10 seminaries, uh, producing right up to PhD. Now, the, probably the most well-known seminary in India is run by Chinmay Mission. And they have a two-year program, that's it. I mean, it's like you, you're, you're, after high school you go there and you have a two-year program and you're a sadhu, you're a swami, you become ordained. Maybe, it may, I think Swami Dhyana Saraswati has a three-year program. Uh, so, okay, let's say that's the equivalent of a bachelor's degree. But in most seminaries in this country, you, you get a professional bachelor's degree, master's degree, PhD. And you can get a PhD which is acknowledged, recognized, and you go get a job as a professor somewhere. So they are cranking out people at all levels. And when they teach Christianity in a seminary, they are also teaching comparative religion. They are teaching how to take on a Hindu, how to take, take on a Muslim, what are his vulnerabilities. So if a Hindu kid is marrying a, I know of a Hindu uh, a child of a friend of mine, mm -hmm. who is going to marry a Jewish person, they went to rabbi for counseling. The rabbi had all this stuff about Hinduism. He's well trained about Hinduism. He knows how to talk about it nicely. And if, if somebody is marrying a Christian, the seminary will has a program on how to uh, welcome a Hindu into the family, how to work on him, what to say, what not to say, how to convert him. Muslims have a formal program in the mosque that if you marry, if a Muslim, one of their members marries a non-Muslim, how to bring that person in. I was surprised at the local Durga Mandir near my house yes. in Princeton. Uh, I was there one day and there was this Indian young fellow and he had a white girl, probably they were married or something. So he, she was very curious to ask all these questions. She must have told this guy, take me to understand Hinduism and he was embarrassed. And then she must have said, let's go to a temple and maybe they will tell us. And so uh, the, the Purohit there was, uh, didn't know what to say. So she was asking questions like, why you do this and why you do that? And he was giving silly answers like, you do that to, to, share, to scare the devil away. Mm. Uh, yeah, this kind of, I mean, kind, kind of a country bumpkin kind of an answer. Totally unsophisticated, had no sense of how to do this. So I don't even think that the pundits are trained in uh, how to be camera savvy.